Thank like you. Call this meeting of the Zion City Council to order. Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Here. Commissioner McDowell? Here. Commissioner Fisher? Here. Commissioner Dettine? Here. Mayor Hill? Here. Uh, Pastor Carlson? So we pray. God in heaven, I thank you so much for the privilege of coming before you. You are the master of the universe, the creator, and the keeper of all, and we thank you for that. We do come into a new year with hearts full of gratitude and thanksgiving. Father, before I'd ask for anything, I would thank you for our country. Thank you, Father God, for those who serve in elected positions across the land. Thank you, Father, for our great state. D despite difficulties, we are a great state and a great people. Thank you for our city, Father, and again, a great city, a great community to live in. I pray, Father, for those that are involved in making this even a better place. But I thank you for that. I thank you for our armed services, Father, those who are wearing the uniform uh, around the world and keeping us safe. I thank you, Father God, for those locally, the firemen, the policemen, the, the uh, paramedics, Father, those who watch over us. I thank you, Father, for these elected officials, the, the mayor and the commissioners, Father. I thank you for what they do and all the department heads. I thank you, Father, for those that plow the roads. I thank you for those that pick up the garbage. I thank you for those that, that work in the offices and make sure things are done well and regulations are enforced. For all these things, we're thankful, Father God. You've given us so much, and we take it so much for granted. I do pray tonight that you'd help us to remember. I pray that you'd help us, Father, to renew our faith in you and in one another. I pray, Father God, that you would refresh our hearts and our spirits, that you'd help us, Lord, to look for that which is good in one another and not appeal to the lower denomination. Father, I thank you so much for the evening that you have planned. I ask for great things to be done, decisions to be made in comedy and good faith and integrity and character. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number four on the agenda is agenda changes. Do the commissioners have any agenda changes? Hearing none, is there a motion to accept the agenda as presented? So moved. Motion? Second. And a second. Is there a discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Dettine? Aye. Mayor Hill? Aye. Item number five is citizens' comments. Uh, we have Mr. Dave Regal. Uh, just come up to the microphone and. Uh... I just got. Back in August, I got a trailer was stolen out of my back driveway. And I called and made a report. And he left, and I talked to my neighbors, and I had a witness to that seen the people that took it and gave them a description of the vehicle and stuff, and the two guys. And then we kind of, I kind of went around the, me and my brother kind of went around the bars to see if they could, anybody, nobody with this type of a description. And we spotted the vehicle two blocks from my house, so we recorded that. And then my neighbor, person had seen the people rip it off, spotted it off a jewel, seen the two guys, called the police. I need the two guys like a month later at the same address. And then I was wondering what's going on. On January 3rd, I finally went to the police department and asked about it, and it hadn't even been assigned to a detective yet. I wonder why it takes four months to get something assigned to a detective in this town. January 3rd is when I went to the, the police station to ask about it, found out it was not assigned yet. So I'm just wondering, what do you got to do to get... Because, I mean, they didn't come and they didn't fingerprint anything. They were fingerprinted the car. They were fingerprinted the garbage can. They had to move my garbage can to steal the trailer. They were fingerprinted that. They, they probably had the people by now. I went there and the guy told me, he said, well, we can bring the guy in for a photo ID, a photo lineup. And if the guy already identified him to the cops when he called it in, why do you got to have him come in for that? I don't know. I just want to know why all these screw-ups are happening. I'm out money because of this, and nothing seems like nothing's being done. And it wouldn't have been assigned to the detective if I didn't go up and say something on January 3rd. I'd still be sitting there. Who, who did you talk to at the police department? 
I, I don't remember the guy's name. Whoever's inside got assigned the thing is who, who, who I talked to at the police department. Who is in charge of the case right now? So. So I'm just kind of a little furious about it. I'm just, so I'm out the money. I'm out a few grand. And I can't afford it. So I just, I just want it known. I just want something done about it. That's all I'm asking. Is, there's got to be a way of getting it to the detectives in less than four months. I have someone check into this stuff. Yeah. Um, so did Lieutenant Bartlett say what was done? Well, I haven't talked to him since. He said that he had called the guy and he's going to come in for a photo, photo lineup. That's the last I heard. That's all I've heard so far. That's it. I haven't gone back in because I don't need the headache. I mean, I don't want to get frustrated again. So I, that's everything that I know and up to date. I'm just, I'm just kind of frustrated about it because it's not the first time. I've got my truck stolen, work van which is broke into and stuff stolen out of that, tools. I've got my truck spray painted in the back, got my fence spray painted in the back. Camper broken into, good thing there was nothing in there to steal. So I, it just seems like nothing there, oh, for, they're batting the zero. Nothing's happening, it seems like. I'm just irritated. I'm tired of being a target, being a victim. I want something done. That's all I'm asking. So. Um, I can address it in part. Um, he spoke to Lieutenant Bartlett. The case was assigned to the detective a lot sooner than that. Unfortunately, the detectives have a huge caseload. Anywhere from 30 to 50 cases. Most of those are um, serious felonies such as sexual assaults and crimes of that nature. So those are going to take priority to, to the theft of a trailer, unfortunately. As far as the identification, he's talking about a photo lineup. Um, that's required by the state's attorney's office. They're not going to pursue charges or press charges against the individual based on the description alone. Uh, if a person witnesses a crime and supplies a description to us, the state's attorney is still going to require us to do a photo lineup. If they can't pick that individual out in a photo lineup, it's going to be a little more difficult to prosecute that case. Oh, he told me that the witness told me that he seen him at Jewel, called the police, and he, I think he said it was the same two guys. So he said, so I don't know if that still counts has to, anything. Still has to do a photo lineup. It's well, part of, part of the requirement. Why wasn't it done then? Something done then. It took, that was back in like October. And it's still nothing. They, they didn't do anything until I went down there and asked him about it. The guy that I talked to said I wasn't even assigned to a detective yet. So then he called me back after he said it was said he got assigned it. And he had the guy come in for a photo line up then. Four months is a long time for someone's memory to, to when it happened in August. I, I just think it should be moved up a little quicker. Yeah, so that, I don't know what the timeline was. So um, that's what I'm frustrated about. I mean, then if it was them, if they had fingerprinted the garbage can that they moved, maybe they'd have it. I don't know. Nothing was done. They didn't fingerprint anything in the vehicle that was stolen. One of my tools were stolen out of the vehicle. I don't know. I just, I'm kind of frustrated. Okay, I, you, you brought this to our attention, and um, I'm going to look, look into it with our uh, police chief and our detective. Here's my card. Um, I'll give me a call about it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Item number six is the consent agenda. The clerk, please read the consent agenda. Approval of minutes of a regular meeting held on January 3rd, 2017 at 7 p.m. Bills, vouchers 128274 through 128329, drawn on First Merit Bank, total $110,268.49. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll move to approve the consent agenda. A motion, second, and a second. Is there a discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Dettine? Aye. Mayor Hill? Aye. Item number seven is consider passing resolution as follows. Seven A is amending personnel authorization for Administrator Nabel. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, we recently received notification of retirement from a member of the Accounts and Finance Department. That retirement will be effective March 29th of 2018. As a result of this, we'd like to post and hire for the replacement on that position. We um, would ideally like to bring that person on board in early February so we have a couple of months to have some cross training and then to be able to shadow the employees and kind of get up to speed before the, the other employee retires. 
As a result of that, we need to amend the personnel authorization temporarily to add for an additional account technologist position. We currently have a senior account technologist and two regular account technologists. I'm asking that it goes to three account technologists so we can do the hiring and then we could always remove that back after the retirement. But it would be about six weeks that we'd have some overlap there as far as um, salaries and positions. So you're saying that you want the uh, um, authorization until March 29th, 2018. At that time, it would revert back to what it is today. Correct. Okay. Is there a motion? Move for approval. Second. Second motion in a second. Is there a discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Deteen? Aye. Very good. Aye. Item number eight is consider passing ordinances as follows. 8A is establishing an updated sexual harassment prohibition policy and procedure for the City of Zion in order to comply with the Public Act 100-0554 per Administrator Naval. Thank you again. Uh, as, as you stated, under Public Act 100-0554, the City is required to uh, adopt a sexual harassment policy um, we currently have a policy in place, but this updates that to, to be in compliance with the act. Um, and I would recommend approval. Mayor, I'd like to discuss this before we move on. Okay, um, so I've, I've looked at uh, Public Act 100-0554, and uh, what's required in that act is that the city have a policy uh, by today, January 16th, and we actually already have a policy. But that policy has to include, according to this act, uh, a prohibition on sexual harassment. It has to have uh, the procedure for reporting an allegation of sexual harassment. It has to have a prohibition on retaliation for reporting an, alle an, alleg uh, an allegation of sexual harassment. And it has to have the consequences for violating the sexual harassment policy and for knowingly making false report. So our current policy, I believe, has all those components in it, um, not um, as expanded as uh, the new policy would, but I think in terms of being compliant with this requirement to have a policy in place by January 16, um, I think we, we already meet that requirement with our old policy. And the reason I'm bringing this to the attention of the council is because I have some problems with the wording of our uh, proposed policy. And I'd be happy to discuss those now if you'd, if you'd like. Um, my main concern is uh, the, the broadness of this policy. Um, in the state of Illinois, there are, if I counted correctly, um, 20 classes of people, or I think the state calls the characteristics of people um, that we as an employer can't discriminate against. And I'd just like to say at the, at the beginning, I don't have any issue on the discrimination issue with, with those 20 different categories. But the way this policy is worded, it seems that um, it, it expands what um, sexual harassment is to these broader categories or characteristics or classes of people. And I'll just give you an example. So uh, in our proposed new policy, it, it says uh, actions, words, jokes, uh, or comments based on an individual's sex, sexual identity, orientation, civil union partnership, or any form of sex discrimination or harassment will not be tolerated. And um, in this policy, it just lists uh, the, the broader categories um, that, that could um, be harassed. So I, I want to give an example. If there's a, a city employee um, that has an opinion that um, marriage is between a man and a woman only. And uh, we have uh, in our, uh, as one of our employees, uh, a, a same-sex couple that knows of that opinion that that city employee has, or maybe has even heard that city employee 
say, I think that marriage is between a man and a woman only, and there are no exceptions to that. That's my opinion uh, on the, the issue. Um, could that employee who has that opinion uh, be liable under this sexual harassment policy? And it seems to me that that would be possible because of, uh, it says, actions, <laughs> words, jokes, or comments based on an individual's sex, sexual identity, orientation, civil union partnership, or any other form of sex discrimination will not be tolerated. It seems that it expands to, to um, include the personal opinions that employees might have um, about very controversial in our society, very controversial topics. So that's what I um, object to in, in the wording of this proposed uh, policy. I, I even have a suggestion for what we could say, if you're interested. Okay, let me let me just uh, respond to that. Um, it's it's my understanding that this policy does not prohibit anybody from having any opinion that they want. It prohibits them from um, saying, uh, doing anything, saying anything, joking about it in the workplace that would make somebody feel. Um, that it was a hostile work environment. So the employee could have that opinion, an employee can, can have that opinion at home, or they can have that opinion um, when they're out to eat, or they can have that opinion wherever they want, but they can't express that opinion in a hostile manner, or in a joking manner, or to, to make somebody feel like there's a hostile work environment. So it only applies to on the job. Yeah. Well, I would agree that it shouldn't be hostile, um, so that, that's an important point. But for a person to, to hold an opinion, or I mean, this would be another example. Um, if a person has the opinion, an uh, employee of the city has the opinion that um, gender is determined by biology, uh, not by choice, um, and that opinion is known or stated by that employee, uh, would that make that employee liable to sexual harassment? And under this policy, I, um, it seems like that would be the case. Number one, it would depend on the circumstances surrounding how it was, but I think the, the goal of this is to prohibit employees from voicing those opinions. They can have those opinions, but not at the workplace. You don't know who your audience is. You don't know what your coworkers uh, may or may not do. So you may think you know the person. The whole idea is to prohibit this type of behavior from people walking around. You could have your beliefs, you could have your opinions, but you can't do it at, in a work setting, in a workplace or a city function that may make other employees uncomfortable or subject them to harassment. And I do, I, I take your point that we already have a prevention policy and we've had that prevention, sexual harassment prevention policy for a number of years. This is more comprehensive. And unfortunately, times are changing. I don't know when the city enacted this. I want to say 2004. Is that correct? In the past 14 years, things have changed dramatically, whether you agree with them, whether employees agree with them or not, but that's the world we live in now. And we need to comply with the state requirements, and we need to put a prohibition policy, and we need to be more comprehensive as to who is protected, what types of classes are protected, what's allowed, what isn't allowed. Nowhere in the prohibition policy or the prevention does it say that you can't have a specific belief or an opinion, but it just tells you what you can and can't do around city employees. So. And it, it, it's my understanding it, it goes well beyond city employees. It, it applies to All vendors. city officials, right. correct. I mean, it applies to vendors, it applies to anybody that has any connection at all with the city. Uh, this protection applies. Okay. Well, this, right, this applies. This is our policy. And again, you, you can't, you know, there's some, um, I don't want to say if there are examples, but, the, but you can only list what comes to mind immediately. I mean, everything else would have to be looked on a case-by-case -case basis. But if trying to go with your scenario, your hypothetical, if an employee has a belief, they shouldn't share that in the workplace. Again, you don't know 
Um, you may think you know your colleagues or your coworkers, but you really don't know. So you don't want to be offensive or sub subject them to any type of potential harassment in the workplace. And I guess I would, I would, uh, let me add on to this that I think it 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 depends on the circumstances of that case. Um, I think it, because when I when you read three on page two, it says such conduct has a purpose or effect of substantially interfering with an individual's work performance or creating an intimidating, hostile, or offensive working environment. And I think if there's a discussion about issues, um, I don't think that um, substantially interferes with an individual's work performance. However, if there's a, a either a, 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 a slur of some type. Uh, that could uh, provide an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work environment. So I think it goes beyond just opinions, and I think the investigation that would uh, take place after an allegation were made would determine whether it was uh, substantially interfered and whether it was intimidating, hostile, or offensive working environment. Because uh, I, 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 I when, when I find that, uh, I find your point, um, is, it, is the right word, onerous? I, I find that like almost frightening that you can't have an opinion. But I, but I think when I'm, when I'm as, as I was listening to our attorney that the difference is how, what, what the circumstances are when you're, when you're, what's being said, how it's being said, all of that. Because I remember uh, giving a seminar on sexual harassment and there was, there's the difference between, you know, that's you have a really nice dress on today. That, that's a very pretty dress. Or, wow, that's a really nice dress you're wearing there. And there's a difference. And those things are... There's a difference in how it's said and how it's perceived. Because you could say it in a way that you didn't mean anything by it, but it could be perceived um, as a, a threat or harassment. Right. Exactly. And, and that's kind of why my my... Uh, when I was given the courses on this, it was you err on the side of Caution. don't do anything. Don't say anything. Don't do anything. Don't joke. Don't have anything up in your locker. Just don't do it. Stay away from it. Generally, with, and, um, with harassment prevention training, which I've, you know, I've had at my employment, it's whatever the intent is, it's how it's received by the person. So if you say something and someone, it's, it's their perception that is the functioning point here. So if they feel that, you know, whatever comment or whatever gesture is made or whatever behavior is exhibited is offensive to them in some way, then they can bring their complaint saying, I felt that this treatment was harassing me. So the, the the function is is not even it, it's not so much it's the it's how the person who feels harassed perceives it first. I, it, I was under the impression, and again, this is a few years back when I was doing this. That it was it's not necessarily the individuals; it's what a reasonable person mm -hmm. would perceive as whether this is harassment or not. So that. So that if, if somebody said something to me, I can, I can throw up my hands and say, oh, I'm, I'm harassed, I'm harassed. But it has to be a reasonable person. It's not a reasonable man or it's not a reasonable woman. Mm -hmm. It's what would a reasonable person, how would they interpret what was said? And at least that's the last that I saw. And who is that, that reasonable person? Hmm? Who is that reasonable person? Well, it's, it's, it's the same thing as, as you do with uh, you know, reasonable doubt. It's, it's what is... What, what reasonable people would judge to be either harassment sure. or non-harassment or guilt it's or just, innocence. My point is it's very, that's very subjective. Yeah, but it's less subjective than, yeah, than yeah. It, it's just the person who's, who's claiming it. Because I could claim to be uh, uh, intimidated or uh, a hostile work environment if, if somebody says, uh, you know, gosh, you're... you're uh, putting on weight. The thing is that this policy almost creates that hostility because it would, knowing what the parameters are here, it almost makes me afraid to, to um, say anything. 
That's inappropriate. I don't think that's I don't think that's a good policy. Well, it's what's our, that's what our policy right now. Does. But why do you need to talk about somebody's sexual orientation in the first place? What, what relevance does that have? He's, he's not. You're not. I don't think you're talking about. You're not talking that's about somebody's. Yeah. Talking directly to somebody about their sexual orientation. You're talking yeah, about and I, you know, a in casual conversation. That. Um, uh, it, it is possible to somebody to ask your. Uh, an opinion. What do you think about same-sex marriage? Um, you know, you're on break or something like that. That conversation is overheard, and then the next thing you know, you're being charged with sexual harassment because a person felt uncomfortable because of your opinion. And the the reverse could be the the, the, the true. You could have a homosexual couple talking about their relationship, and then um, a person of a differing opinion. Could say I don't agree with that, and that makes me feel uncomfortable, and I, I feel harassed. I think this policy allows for that be that kind of behavior, those kind of charges, and um, I have a suggestion. It, it's it would have to be uh, word Smith, perhaps, but um, instead of that sentence that um, is very broad, uh, I would propose this. Uh, the City of Zion recognizes that there will be differences of opinion related to the list of protected characteristics in the state of Illinois. And like I said, there's about 20 of those characteristics. Um, and that we emphatically state that such differences of opinion or expression of those opinions do not constitute sexual harassment as defined by this policy. Now that would make me feel a lot more comfortable in a work environment if I, if I knew um, an opinion, not stated in hostility, but an, uh, an opinion would not result in a charge of sexual harassment. I think that, I, I take your comments with all due respect, but I think that would just invite more confusion and put the city in, in a weaker position. We, you need to take a strong position that the city will not tolerate these types of activities. And comparing the prohibition policy that is before the council this evening to the 2004 prevention policy, these protected characteristics, these protected classes aren't even mentioned in there. No, but they're, they're inferred. They're not even mentioned in there. And again, it, the city, it's as though the city is putting their head in the sand and not recognizing that times have changed. <coughs> this is the time to take a strong position and put a prohibition policy in effect. Again, opinions, you're 24 seven, you're allowed to have an opinion. I guess the good rule of thumb is don't share that at work. If you, if somebody asks your opinion about something, I think the, the response should be, we'll go and have a cup of coffee and I'll, I'll share my opinions with you, but I don't think we should do it here at the workplace. Then you've just alleviated any concern of a colleague or a co-worker or an employee overhearing a conversation. I think our, our current policy meets the standard um, and I, I guess I'd like more time to, to look at this and maybe discuss with you, Paula, some of the some of these things. Well, the problem is um, our office sent this over and it didn't make the agenda for the January 3rd meeting and we're under the gun. And yeah, but I, what I'm saying, I think the current policy meets the requirement of uh, Public Act 100-0554. Well, again, I think it doesn't take into account the changes that the public DAC is trying to get municipalities and public bodies to recognize. Not accept, not agree with, but recognize so that all employees have this protection. I don't think it invites anything. I think common day living, common day experience, if somebody's out there being harassed, I don't think enacting this is going to create new harassment allegations. If it's been going on, it's been going on. If it hasn't, it has it. I don't think this invites, I think this protects more. I think it's a comprehensive policy and I think the city needs to enact it this evening. Okay, I've got a couple other questions. Then. Sure. Um, so um, one of the 
uh, penalties for uh, for being charged with sexual harassment is, um, I mean, there's a whole list. Um, disciplinary action up to and including dis discharge uh, from employment. Commissioner, where are you? Um, uh, page three. Um, any employee who engages in practices or conducts, uh, this is the one, two, three, fourth paragraph. Um, constituting sexual harassment shall be subject to disciplinary action up to and including discharge. Um, are there any, um, would violation of this policy be a criminal offense? I think, um, I can't say yes, I can't say no. It would depend on what the nature of the conduct is, okay. whether or not, um, it yeah, would rise it to could, the level possibly, of criminal. Okay, yeah. sure, so possibly, yeah. if, yes. If somebody, okay. you know, touched somebody or it if could it be violated state a, statutes. It could be yeah. considered an assault or. So uh, I, I really could, can't answer that with a blanket yes right. or no. Okay. It would depend on, what on the, the circumstances. What the um, any city official, including elected or appointed official who engages in practices or conduct constituting sexual <laughs> harassment, shall be subject to appropriate remedial action up to and including removal from office. So I guess my question is, what what is the um, what is the ability that wh whoever is adjudicating this policy, what ability do they have to remove a uh, elected official from office? Well, it, it would depend on the circumstances. If they're, uh, I mean, the nature of that. I mean, if using your early example, what if it constituted criminal felony activity? And what if they were convicted? Sure. Ultimately I mean that, of that. that's already I mean, state law. If you've committed a crime, you can be removed from public office. But if you're in violation of this policy, um, can uh, well in this policy it would be the city administrator that would uh, adjudicate it. Could the city administrator then remove you from office if one of our you know an elected official from office? The city administrator could make a determination that this the body would have to. To act to try to remove the official based on whatever the uh, results of that were. I, again, I think this is just saying these are all the things that could happen. And again, I think by the removal of office, you're looking at the far end of the spectrum. Yeah, well, it's stated here. So. Right. Well, the city administrator certainly couldn't remove anybody from office. No. I didn't I know answer. that. I didn't think that we had the power to remove anybody from the city council. It, I think it's included in there to say this is the potential if you're at the far end of the spectrum. If you committed a crime. Well. I think there's enough questions here that I, I'd, if we, if there was a motion to vote on it, I would, uh, I would not vote in favor of this policy. So um, I don't want to be presumptuous, but if I would move that we table this until we can review it. Is there a motion to table? I'm making a motion that we table this. Okay. Um, as uh, Administrator Naval indicated in his opening remarks, um, this needs to be approved by the municipalities by today's date. And again, this was sent in. It was supposed to be heard earlier. It didn't make the agenda, and it is before right. you tonight. Can so a case not be made that our current policy meets these four qualifications in the public act, that there's a prohibition on sexual harassment, that there's a procedure for reporting allegations, that there's a prohibition for retaliation, and that there's consequences, because our current policy um, has all those things in it. Yeah, and as we discussed earlier, it is our opinion that the prevention policy of 2004 is lacking and it's not as comprehensive as it should be. Right, but it, it, meets, it, meets the it, it meets the letter of the law for passing an ordinance by January 16. I guess that's my, my question. Does it meet the letter of the law? It is our opinion it does not. Okay. That's why you have before you the prohibition policy. Okay. I think it does. All right, let me ask this. Did, did you have any other questions? Probably if I read it more <laughs> thoroughly. But I, I have read it pretty thoroughly. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I don't, yes, I do. So I, I'd like to table it and look at it 
okay, more thoroughly. A motion. Does there need to be a second and a vote on a table and motion? There is a motion on the floor, right. motion to table. Right. So I haven't heard a second no, to that motion yet. I, do we need a second? I mean, I mean, I mean need to have a regular vote. We could. Okay. Or it could die for lack of a is second. It, is there a second? We have I a motion. Second it. We have a motion, motion and a second. Motion to table and a second. So is there further need. discussion? I respect uh, Commissioner McDowell's comments, but I feel that we should pass this on the advice of council to be on the safe side. Further discussion? I, I have a question. <clears throat> Paula brought up something that I thought would be that would resolve some of the problem. If someone has an opinion, about uh, sexual orientation, and they're talking about it on the job. She suggested that you not talk about it on the job. Go have a cup of coffee, and uh, and and then express your opinion. But as elected officials, we're we're actually on our job 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we go to the coffee shop, and we're talking about uh, an issue that uh, is controversial. Uh, and somebody hears it and they don't like it, are we still subject uh, to discipline or uh, vi uh, are we violating the uh, laws as presented? Again, as, as they tried to enumerate in here that, and it specifically calls out, depending on the circumstances, if somebody, uh, and again, we're, we're trying to take specific examples and say yes or no. I think what the, the prohibition policy is trying to make very, very clear is people need to be aware of their surroundings. They need to be aware of the fact that there are uh, differences in the world now that whether you agree with them or not, you have to be um, conscientious of what you say around different people. And if you want to make comments in a public setting that somebody might hear, now are you on the job? No. Um, so I'm trying to answer everybody's specific scenario here, but if somebody overhears it, are they an employee of the city? If it's just a citizen, they might say, well, that, that elected official has some very narrow opinions about people. So would that constitute sexual harassment? No. Is if there's an employee with an earshot that feels that uh, maybe they weren't getting good evaluations at work and they thought maybe there was some biasness or inherent biasness from uh, a commissioner of their department or a department head, then possibly. So I think, I think this is like uh, pro sexual harassment 101. You, you need to be aware of your surroundings. You need to be aware of what you say at all times because you know, times have changed. It doesn't mean you have to accept it. It doesn't mean you have to like it. But you just have to be more cognizant of what you say and where you say it. I, I'm in agreement with the uh, updated policy. And I, I worked in an environment where I was the general manager of a WNBA team. And those questions were always asked. Com Commissioner Fisher, you brought that up. Uh, I was always asked the question, whether on the record or off the record, did I know about my player's sexual orientation because of the perceived uh, image of WNBA players. And my question, was, my answer was always the same. I don't, what's that got to do with the job that they're doing? And I know that in, in any circumstances, whether I'm with, uh, this speaks to everything that's happening with social media on your phone or with whomever you might be talking to in public. There are things that you just will not comment on. I won't because of the inherent dangers of how it might be perceived. And this act, to me, this ordinance is we all need training. The department heads have to make this very clear with their employees of what this represents, that you can't have that opinion. You can't express those opinions at work. If you want to express them in your spare time in your house, you can't do that. But at work, those things are off, just totally off the table because of the ramifications of what could happen. And I think any person with common sense that has seen what's happened, whether you're looking at what's happening in Hollywood, uh, in, in different industries, you just can't broach these subjects. Period. You can't. You can't even. You can't joke about it. 
and it's, uh, it's, it's the sign of the times. Definitely not in the workplace. That, I think that's the key point is that we're talking about a workplace. And, and, and not it's a gotta social be, call. We're talking about a workplace. A, absolutely. And it's got to be up to the, the employees that are asked that question to, to say that that's an inappropriate question to be asked. So don't ask me that question again. I think it's inappropriate in, in, this, in this setting. Or it's just inappropriate, period. We have a motion and a second to table. Is there further discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? This is to table? To table it. N no. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? No. Commissioner Deteen? I'm going to change mine and say no as well because of what we just discussed. Mayor Hill? I'm going to say a no. Is there a motion to approve? I'll move to approve this ordinance. I have a motion? Second. And a second. Is there further discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney. Aye. As nicely and respectfully as possible, I'm going to say no. <laughs> Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Deteen? Aye. Mayor Hill? Aye. It was very good discussion. Excellent. Thank you for and, and great points. Thank you for listening. It, it's, it's just some of these things they're so difficult to discuss. Thank you. Whether it's in this form mm -hmm. or or if it's in a, a personal form, but I think any anyone that is just looking at the world around us is seeing what's happening with this, and just knowing that for me as an elected official. Uh, I feel like I'm on the job all the time and there are certain behaviors that I have to exhibit there there's certain questions that I know that I can respond to or there's an appropriate way for me to respond and it was the same way when I was in professional sports there are things that uh, that were work related it's just like when we have our closed meetings we can't talk about those things yeah. uh, the subject matters now when it comes to sexual harassment uh, anyone that doesn't have their head in the sand would understand that these things just can't happen in the workplace anymore. And the people that aren't aware of it, that continue to say it's not a big deal, whether you feel that way or not, you have to suffer the consequences if you decide to, uh, to push those issues. Yeah, I just, I want to, I, I, I fully understand how, uh, Difficult some of these things are to talk about and to bring them up in, in you know in a public forum like this and I commend you for uh, for doing it and doing it in a very respectful uh, uh, manner and I just appreciate the everybody on the council's response too that uh, anyway I appreciate it so sure. um, item eight B is considered zoning zoning docket eighteen Z one requesting a text amendment adding article. 12, alternative energy systems to the Zion Municipal Code to regulate wind, solar, geothermal energy systems with the approval of a special use permit other than residential building, integrated and building mounted solar energy systems per Director Ionson, Planning and Zoning Commission recommends approval. Thank Director you, Your Honor, Commissioners. Currently, the Zion Municipal Code does not address alternative energy systems. The draft proposed ordinance regulates wind, solar, and geothermal energy systems. The ordinance requires a special use permit for all systems except residential building, integrated, and building mounted solar energy systems. The state has approved funding for grant and tax credits for installation of these systems. Additionally, ComEd is offering a program called net metering to buy back over-generated electricity. Staff is recommending we approve the draft ordinance at the January 4, 2018 Planning and zoning meeting, they voted to approve docket 18Z1, alternative energy systems. Is there a motion? So, so move to approve the uh, draft ordinance. You have a motion? Second. second. And a second. Is there a discussion? I just had one question for Director Ionson. In the, the part of the, the restrictions for residential, it says that residents can only have 
uh, vertical axis wind turbines. Is there a particular reason? Do you know why that requirement is in there? Yeah, the, uh, the horizontal is a wider down blade. The vertical is more of a, a vertical axis on it. So it's more for protection for, uh, for wildlife. Okay. More so than anything else. And it's also because there's a, there's a certain height restriction for residential also? Yeah, you can't exceed 45 feet. Okay, so yeah, if you want a, a turbine that's gonna actually develop any power, those, any blade, those blades be coming awful close to you. You wouldn't be able to do it in residential. Right, okay, thank you. Motion and second, yes. Is there further discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Dettine? Aye. Hi. Right. Item 8C, amending Zion Municipal Code, Chapter 10, Building and Buildings Regulation, Article 2, Construction Regulations, Section 10-54, International Energy Conservation Code, 2015 IECC, per Director Ionson. Thank you, Your Honor. The State of Illinois recently mandated that all municipalities adopt the latest published edition of the International Energy Conservation Code. Staff is recommending that we adopt the 2015 version without any amendments. Is there a motion? So moved. The motion? Second. And a second. Is there a discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Dettine? Aye. Commissioner Hill? Aye. Uh, item 8D is regarding the disposition of surplus property for Chief Dumian. Well, thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. The attached list of firearms is recommended to be declared as surplus and traded with an approved FFL dealer. A full description of each item to include the make, model, and serial number is listed. These firearms are property of the police department and were not a result of relinquishment or previous criminal cases. Similar trades have been performed in the past and allow the department to augment budgetary needs for its firearm and tactical programs. All responsibility for the requisite documentation of transfer will be managed by the FFL dealer. I respectfully request the City Council approve the transfer of these items with an approved FL, FFL dealer for a trade-in value of $1,970. Make that motion. We have a motion? A second. And a second. Is there discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Dettine? Aye. Commissioner Hill? Aye. Item 9 is discussion authorization and approval. 9A is request permission to fill one sergeant vacancy and request the next candidate from the Police and Fire Commission sergeant eligibility list for Chief Dumian. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor Commissioners. With the retirement of one police sergeant in September of 2017, our agency has a need to fill this vacant sergeant position. I respectfully request the City Council approve the filling of one sergeant vacancy from the current eligibility register of police sergeant candidates established by the Zion Board of Fire and Police Commissioners. I'll make a motion that we uh, fill this vacant sergeant position with the next candidate um, established by the Zion Board of Fire and Police Commissioners. I have a motion. Second. And a second. Is there a discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Dettine? Aye. Mayor Hill? Aye. Item 9B is consider approval of purchase of three firearms and optical equipment for the tactical response team for Chief Dumi. Well, thank you again, Mayor Commissioners. I respectfully request the City Council approve the purchase of three firearms and optical equipment from the tactical for the tactical response team. The equipment will be purchased to the same FFL dealer strikers in Milwaukee, Wisconsin that, will be trade, that we will be trading the surplus firearms with. A breakdown of the equipment purchase is included on page two of this written request. The sum total of firearms purchase minus the trade-in credit is $2,554.20. The general fund will not be used for this purchase and funds for this purchase will come from the drug assets, asset forfeiture fund. Make a motion we purchase these firearms. Make a motion. Second. A second. Any discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Dettine? Aye. Mayor Hill? Aye. Item 9C is consider quotes for IT services per Administrator Naval. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, the City of Zion has not gone out for quotes on IT services for many years, so we felt it would 
be prudent to do some due diligence and just make sure we were still in market on our IT services. Um, we actually had quotes from three different companies, our current provider, as well as Proven IT and Platinum Systems. Um, we typically spend about 45000 a year currently on a kind of a pay-as-you-go on an hourly basis for services rendered. The computer help key proposal to match the proposal of Proven and Platinum gave us a managed IT service proposal, which is basically monitoring and proactive response to, to things, but they had to obviously put a cushion in there to um, versus their hourly response uh, rates now to allow for them to address anything that may come up. So their proposal is actually a little higher than our, act, our average annual amount. But even with that, you can see that there's a significant savings um, in remaining with computer help key over the other proposals. Um, I would recommend that actually we reject all of those proposals and continue to do the hourly, uh, use the hourly rate system that we're under now, um, since that's resulted in actually less expenditures than a, than a managed service uh, contract. Additionally, uh, under either of the, under any of these to provide support with our current hardware, workstations, server, et cetera, uh, for them to take responsibility for that, we would have to replace a significant amount of those to make sure their security risks are addressed, operating systems are updated, things of that nature. And we have a lot of, a lot of IT that is currently um, in need of replacement. So even if we went with these higher proposals for managed IT, we'd still have to spend additional funds getting our, our hardware up to date. So um, when it comes budget time, we'll be talking more about that. I'd, I'll highly be pushing for getting getting us on an infrastructure replacement plan for, for computers and network servers. But uh, as it relates to this, I would say we reject all the proposals and continue with our current uh, IT services uh, with computer help key. So will this up, update, will that bring us into the 20th century? If we invest funds into, <laughs> <laughs> we, might, we might get to 2000. <laughs> Is there a motion? I'll move to uh, reject these proposals per the recommendation of the city administrator. Second. Second. The motion and the second. Is there discussion? Mm -hmm. Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Dettine? Aye. Mayor Hill? Aye. Item 9D is consider solar lease option for solar panels to provide renewal energy into the local supply per administrator naval. Thank you, Mayor Commissioners. At a prior council meeting, there was a presentation from two companies regarding leasing property at our former landfill site that's owned by the city. Uh, the intent is to put solar panels at the site to provide renewable energy uh, and, and put that back actually into the local supply. Based on the results of the presentations from the company, as well as the, the financial terms and track records of the company as far as successful projects, our recommendation would actually be to enter into this lease option with uh, Synergy. We actually have Representative William Pham here for any questions that you may have. Please note this is a lease option. Um, they will be needing to do their due diligence, have their engineers look at the site, make sure everything's viable. This gives them the time to do that. They'll, they'll be investing those funds in that process. And then once everything is viable from their end, they go through the application and they, they work on the application process for grant funding, things of that nature. Then we will enter into an actual lease agreement uh, with some general terms that we're agreeing to here. But um, there was some questions brought up at prior council meetings too as far as remediation, should the, the site close or not be utilized anymore. Um, those are all items that will be addressed in the actual lease agreement before uh, we execute that this is just an option so that they can show that they have rights to the property uh, going forward for grant purposes. So I recommend we enter into this lease option. Is there a motion? I'll move to approve this lease option. Second. A motion and a second. Uh, is there a discussion? I had a question. Um, I, I, I believe, uh, Mr. Nabel, that w when we had were talking about this, that there was some uh, possibility of if we do this, that it, there's a possibility that it would reduce the electric rates for uh, residents of our community. Is that true? Or Pot I, potentially. Did I, did we, I dream that? No, you didn't dream that. Um, because we have electrical ag aggregation, we can 
um, basically contract for a supplier um, in which Synergy could be that supplier at a reduced rate um, because of the credits that are given and what, what they can actually produce the energy for. So we could, we, we have to look at all the, the logistics and the bid process and everything, how that works with aggregation. So we basically have the time of this lease option to determine that, um, but they could bid as a supplier and actually have us be the customer um, for that at a rate that might be less than, than what we're currently paying. Okay. Mr. Pam, what is your timeline on something like this? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, our timeline is a year for the lease okay. option, and I think that gives us plenty of time to uh, work with the city to make sure uh, the site's viable, like Administrator Nabel was saying, and also to potentially enter into uh, a power services agreement uh, to provide power at a cost. Our, our goal is to provide power at a cost that's lower than what's competitive on the market. Now, it's my understanding that this is a phase one of a grant program, or, or what? what is? Well, Mr. Fan may be able to address that more, but there's community, this yeah. is a community solar project. Right, right. There's a community solar program that's part of the state's overall incentive program to provide uh, what they call renewable energy credits, right. which help uh, subsidize these projects so that we can deliver power at a rate that's very competitive to the market, uh, even though it's very clean solar power. Is there a, uh, a second phase uh, where if there were a possibility of doing this on a much larger scale, that would you be interested in that in a year from now or two years from now? Yes, definitely. Uh, most likely the community solar program limits each project to only two megawatts AC, so that's about 10 acres of solar, so we would just try to do more multiples of that size in uh, different parcels that are available to us. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. We have a motion and a second. <coughs> Is there further discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Racine? Aye. Mary Hill? Aye. Item 9E is considered approval to move forward with phase two consolidation study for a functional consolidation between the Zion Fire Rescue Department and the Beach Park Fire Protection District per Administrator Nabel. Uh, thank you again. Uh, at prior council meetings, we've had discussions about uh, consolidation options with Beach Park um, for our fire services. We've determined that a functional consolidation might be the best route to go. We did a phase one study to see initially if there was uh, benefit to be had, not specific details, but to see if it, would, it, it was worth going forward based on current call volumes, personnel, locations, things of that, that nature. It was determined as a result of that phase one that it was worth further exploration. Um, this phase two would look at current equipment, staffing, location and say on a functional consolidation level, what would we actually do to implement that and where could we see those benefits? How would we structure that with, with current equipment personnel um, response time, you know, while continuing to meet response times and needs of the community? Um, we would be, the proposal is $19,850 for the study that would be split between the city and Beach Park Fire Protection District. Um, so, uh, we, you know, we would be at, you know, 9,000, just, just shy of 10,000. Um, we are also currently in the process of applying for a grant uh, with the IAFF to um, help with some of the costs, help offset some of the costs of this. Whether that will be successful or not has yet to be determined. Um, and to what extent that grant might cover this uh, is unknown. I believe it's a $2,500 grant that we're applying for. Beach Park may be applying for, for that as well. Um, but I would, we would hope that that would offset some of our costs as well. But based on this, uh, the meeting that we had um, and the results of the phase one study, I would recommend approval of going forward with the phase two uh, study to determine how, how best to proceed. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion that we uh, approve this phase two of our consolidation study. I have a motion? Second. And a second. Is there a discussion? David, it's uh, my understanding that um, at the completion of the study, 
um, we would have the information necessary for uh, for our council and the Beach Park Fire Protection Board to make a decision on um, consolidation. Is that correct? Correct. So similar to when we did the comprehensive plan, we looked and adopted the comprehensive plan and said, okay, this is what we're going to follow and work towards. That would be the same here. You'll look at the results of the study and determine, yep, we agree that this is the direction we're going to go and what we want to implement. And because we're going with this um, organization, um, it also gives us some standing in applying for grants and um, because we've done the research. It's not just our opinion that it could work. Correct. It's an independent third party you know, report saying that there is benefit in this versus our internal opinions okay <clears throat> any other comments well I've got a couple um, I guess I'm going to express my frustration with this whole process uh, we started this in October of 2015 um, so we're uh, over two years into this process and I don't know that anything has happened um, since we met as a group here and, and accepted the phase two. Uh, well, I think you were expecting something other than what a functional consolidation is. And I think with all due respect, everybody did. So a functional consolidation is really departments working together to improve the efficiency of the department. So really, since that time, I wrote a little list of things we've done because I anticipated this. <laughs> we have applied for an AFG grant for the replacement of a ladder truck between the two departments, which actually was not successful. Beach Park's ladder truck needed replacement doing maintenance costs, so they decided not to replace that ladder truck, and they're going back to our old model where Zion's truck will serve as the mutual aid ladder truck, so if they need it, they call for an ARA automatic response line. We've participated in their annual strategic planning sessions for the last two years. Each of our shift commanders now contacts Beach Park, Beach Park contact Zion every morning to see what the staffing is for the day and what their activities are for that day. We've created several options for future administrative alignment, alignment depending on where the next step goes. So whether it's one chief, one deputy chief, do we have one training officer, we've set those. We developed a draft first arriving um, standard operating procedure. We finished that this fall. It's, it could be implemented, but we actually gave it to Beach Park, or I'm sorry, to Winth Barber and Newport to also review because they could as very easily be a first in on a response to Zion or Beach Park as we could to theirs. So we tried to get buy-in from them on that one. Um, training is now being coordinated so that both departments are receiving similar training on a monthly basis, which is a precursor to having one training calendar for all departments. Um, our Quad One North departments train monthly together now. We've also tried for the first time to hold a Illinois Fire Service Institute Cornerstone co course. So the last three Tuesdays, last Tuesday we held a course at the Zion PD, put on by the Illinois State um, Fire Marshal's Office on commercial operations. Uh, we held one today at Newport, and then next Tuesday it's going to be held at Beach Park. So our members were going there, they were coming here, so we get full staffing in each course. Um, we've worked on reducing our CE coordinator the number of times she comes out. So currently she comes out to Zion three times a month. She also goes to Beach Park three times a month. So we're trying to work on a plan where she only comes out three times and then Beach Park comes here to attend CE rather than uh, she going to both departments twice each month. Uh, right now Beach Park's requesting that the shift commander responds on their incidents. The only reason we haven't uh, finalized that is because we're trying to work out the details on what we could do to help us. I mean if we give them our shift commander, they're running their incidents, but what are we going to get in return? So we're working on that. We've been working on this comprehensive study to evaluate the benefits of the functional consolidation. The two unions are actually getting together now also to work together to see, as we move forward, how are they going to work together. So what's happening is there's a lot of little stuff that works behind the scenes that's making our departments work better. They're just not things that are very obvious to the public. They're not seeing any change in operations because that's what a functional consolidation does. Okay, and I, I appreciate all those, but I'm, I'm still frustrated with the fact that um, I, I'm, my expectation was that there was going to be a um, consolidation or looking at things that, was gonna, that will save the city money. Um, and in the 
little over two years that we've been doing this, um, I'm not sure that, that our fire system as it, as, it, as it is right now is sustainable. Um, where I believe the city is bringing in somewhere in the neighborhood of $528,000 of new revenue for the, for the upcoming budget. And I believe $450,000 of it, or fi uh, close to $500,000 of it, is going to pensions. And uh, the, a large portion of that are fire pensions. And I don't, I don't mean to be taking on the fire department, but what we're doing is not sustainable. And what I hear you saying is that there's a bunch of little things that we're going to do that are make us more e efficient, but that it's not going to make us any, uh, any more sustainable. Um, you know, and I, I think, I, I hope somebody's looking at should we go to eight hour shifts? What's instead of going 24? Eight hour shifts will cost you more money because you have to have I, more of the staffing to I get need, the shifts I need covered. To, I need to see that, but it's also going to save us if somebody calls in overtime right now. Uh, often it's 24 hours of overtime that we pay rather than an eight hour of overtime. I mean, the, the police department, I don't understand the difference between police and fire. The, uh, the on, difference on the, is for each piece of equipment just, I just have. Let, let me finish. Okay. Let me finish. There are a number of issues that I think go to the core of firefighting that have been, they, they have, we've been doing them forever. And we can't continue to do them forever the way we're doing them because it's not going to be three years from now. We're not going to have any money uh, in our, in our uh, levy, in our general fund. It's, gonna, it's all going to fire and, and, and pensions. And, and I don't know, I'm, I'm starting to panic because we need to change something drastically. You know, I don't know if we have to privatize part of it or, or we have to look at, at everything and we have to go to extremes here. We have to blow something up here in our, in our financing of the city. And I don't, we're, we're talking about uh, um, consolidating and I don't see it saving us any money. And I'm just, I'm frustrated with this and it's taken so long. I mean, like I said, we're into this for, we're about 27, 28 months into this process. The and staffing portion comes from, I have to put so many seats in a vehicle just to cover. So when an ambulance goes out the door, it has to have two people on it. I can't send it out with one. Fire truck has to go out. Really, it should go out with three to four. We're sending them out with two. And we have a truck and an ambulance at station two, which is staffed by the same two people. Mm -hmm. So they jump from truck to engine. So if somebody calls in sick, I can't just, I can take a vehicle out of service but now we're either not going to have an ambulance responding to somebody in town or we're not going to have a fire truck responding to somebody in the town. So our seven person minimum that we have right now is bare bones. We're running 4,300 calls a year with less staff than some departments running 2,300 calls a year. How are the calls, how, how are the calls counted? I mean, I, I We've see got rid of the double up. Every call we get is a call. So if we get an, an ambulance call and they call for an engine, that's still one call. We no longer do, if the engine call is called out for an ambulance call, it was two calls that we've done in the past, it's now one at the request. And that start mid-year? When did that start? That started in July. You know, and that's reduced our call volume by maybe, I think it was 30 some calls this year. It was never that many. Call volume continues to go up as population goes up, as people grow older, it's just it's the nature everywhere you go. I know, and, and I don't know, uh, some, uh, many, many, many of our calls are, we're taxi cabs. Yes, we are. And um, we need to do something so that if someone's got a cold and they need to, they want to go to the doctor, they're, they're, treat, they're choosing to go to the hospital and they call us to take them to the hospital. We need to do something about and that. And that's I the same know. problem across the board. You're right. And there was a mobile integrated health care plan that was going around. And it's not gaining a lot of teeth around here because, again, it's, it's staffing strong. You have to have people to go out and take care of those, just check on a blood pressure, just check on this kind of call. But Yeah, that's not our mission. That's not our mission. It is the mission. It's the growing mission. It's the next generation of EMS. Well, I, I, it's mobile integrated healthcare, and we're not there. A lot of places aren't there that thought they would be. And, th and that will work if you've got enough money to do it. But we don't have. Correct. The, so I'm, I'm saying we need to drastically look at at different ways of doing things. And I, I again, I, I, I'm, I'm frustrated with the pace of this consolidation. And I'm, I, I don't know. 
part of the savings from the consolidation has to come from this board and Beach Parks Board getting together because from the chief level you can only do so much. We're not a, we can't save money. I can't go tomorrow and tell Chief Tierney, you know what, starting Monday we're going to save your salary, you're going to retire and I'm going to take over both. We're going to get rid of your deputy chief, we'll keep mine or we'll get rid of mine, we'll keep yours. That's not our decision to make. It really, it's a collective decision to really get and, together. And, 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 and that's what I, I need to, I need to see when those, when those decisions, or when are those decisions going to be made? When are they going to come to us with, with all those questions on here's where we can cut costs and it's up to you now, Zion City Council and the, and the Beach Park uh, Fire Protection Board to, to make that decision to do that. When are we going to get those? Well, and that's part of what this study is. This study, if you look on page two of the study, it, it, it's very comprehensive. The first study we did is what they call a dirty study. They just loosely took some of our data and said, okay, based on the data you have, based on the data Beach Park has, this is how long it takes them to respond in your district. This is how long it takes you to respond in their district. They're now going to talk with our staff. They're going to talk with a dispatch communication specialist. They're going to talk, look at budget analysis. They're going to look at each person and each vehicle and see exactly how many minutes they're in use every day. So for so they take our station one ambulance. How many minutes are you in a station? How many minutes are you on training? How many minutes are you on calls? And they'll do that for all our units, all our personnel, all the Beach Parks units, all the Beach Parks personnel. They'll see where every call is running, exactly how long it takes to get to that call, how long they're out of service. That's where we'll start to come back with their plan now and say exactly, okay, you can close this station from, say, 5 o'clock in the afternoon until 6 in the morning. These are your peak busy times. You need more staffing here, you need less staffing here. Staff this station during this time period and this station during this time period and start shifting things around to get a better, you know, what is actually providing the best service delivery based on the funds you have. All right, and what is their, what, what's the date? When are we going to see that information? Um, I don't remember exactly if it's in this contract, but I, I think, think they said it takes months. a couple months yeah, just to write it and do the research. Six months. Six months total. And at the end of that six months, they're going to come to the board before, before anything and just do a presentation for you and Beach Park both. And then it would probably come to a point of starting to make some decisions. All right. If you go in and look at a Derry and Woodridge and Lyle Woodridge, they did almost the exact same thing recently. And there, uh, under Derry and Woodridge's website is the whole consolidation plan that they used. A lot of people get that functional consolidation and consolidation terminology mixed up. Consolidation means we're becoming one department, one entity. Functional consolidation means we're working together to provide more efficient services. And I think that's, when you started the whole consolidation process here, we were looking at funds. And you really can't get there until you start getting the taxpayers involved because you're talking a district and a municipality. You can't make one a district. You can't make one a municipality without voter referendum. And it just gets trickier. So we went down this functional consolidation. And everybody's sharing your frustration. My guys aren't, you know, as happy as they can be because... What's the consolidation mean to me? Am I going to have a Beach Park guy here? Are we losing positions now? Are we gaining positions? People at the top, well, am I going to keep my job? Am I going to lose my job? You know, so everybody's just always anticipating what's next. And to be honest, it isn't moving as fast. Every time we take a step forward, we kind of fall a step back. We take a step forward and we kind of take a step back and it just doesn't gain that momentum. Well, let's keep going forward. To keep moving. And we are. That's what drove this. Beach Park did take it to their city council last week, and they agreed to the 50-50 split as well. Okay, we have a motion and a second. So for the discussion, Clark, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney. Aye. Commissioner McDowell. Aye. Commissioner Fisher. Aye. Commissioner Team. Aye. Mary Hill. Aye. Item 9F is consider approval of enterprise zone application proposal for Director Naval. Thank you, Mayor Commissioners. After receiving notification of your un unsuccessful in obtaining our enterprise zone designation in 2017, we had a phone call with the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, DCEO, in regards to our scoring and our results. As a result of this call, it was determined that we needed to expand our efforts and time frame to give ourselves the best chance to succeed for a 2018 application. 
Uh, subsequent to that, we actually met with Warren Ridley, who's here tonight from WCR Enterprises, and determined to take a more expansive approach to the application process, given the additional lead time that we have available this year. He does have extensive knowledge of the process of what makes up all the scoring components and how to maximize each category. Uh, you have a proposal in there as well as his uh, resume and bio. Um, I would recommend that we enter into the attached agreement with WCR Enterprise Limited under option two of the contract. It is a uh, $80,000 proposal spread out over, I mean, that's gonna be time spent over two years. Um, we did talk with our TIF consultant and we would have to go to the TIF board, so I can't commit to this, but TIF funds can be utilized for um, this application process as well because it would result in economic development tools that we could utilize for development in the TIF districts, which is primarily where, where any development would um, come as a result of enterprise zone anyway. So we could try and minimize depending on how much was uh, approved to the TIF boards and then approved by council, uh, we could minimize the impact on the general fund budget as well. Is there a motion? I'll move to approve this uh, contract under option two for the city administrator. Is there a second? Second. So a motion and a second. Is there a discussion? Um, the company that we used prior to this one, uh, Metropolitan Consulting, or Te was well, it was Tesco through yeah, Chicago yeah, Metropolitan right. Area Planner. So um, I think they charge us about 15000 to do this. Um, what's the difference? What are we getting that's worth 80000 in this proposal that Tesco could do for fifteen? Well, the, the reason, a big part of the reason why it was much less was we were looking at a very condensed time frame. It was kind of a, just based on the deadline that it had to be filed. Um, we tried to throw together what we could uh, based on that. This would be a much more involved approach in meeting with stakeholders, businesses, um, putting together a lot of the research uh, in each category. Uh, it's, it's basically a lot more time. And then we're also getting the follow-up after the application deadline with DCO and those that are scoring this to make sure we stay ahead of them, that we stay on their radar. Um, addressing any questions and things so a lot more time up front to put into these each of these sections to maximize our opportunity as well as the follow-up after whereas before we only had a month lead time now we're looking at this spanning almost 18 months uh, worth of time and effort is there any prediction of the likelihood of us being successful this time <laughs> I don't know, Mr. Ridley may be able to address that. I, I doubt he's going to commit to any sort of uh, likelihood um, other than um, success he's had with other areas and knowing the, um, knowing the process, knowing um, how, the pro how it's scored, how the, the, the act was written. Um, you know, we, we had a meeting and it, he showed us some of the scoring that successful applications, where we fell on that, and kind of the level uh, that we would need to hit. Uh, as far as scores, again, that was based on the past. It depends on how many uh, enterprise zones are coming up for renewal or that are opening up in this next round, and every round becomes more competitive. So those scores that are necessary to be successful will continue to go up. Um, but I believe he has a, a good feel that we could hit those thresholds um, based on our current economic situations and, and you know, demographics, EABs, okay. things of that nature. I mean, nobody can shake a magic eight ball and give you an accurate answer, but, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good chunk of change. I, I understand that, especially with our financial situation, but, uh, it, you know, if one development came as a result of a successful application, that's all it takes to, to easily make that back in, in the long term. Uh, return to the city and the community. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I have a, my qualm is that we're spending $80,000 and if we, if we don't get it, and, you know, Yeah, that's kind of what I was. That's what you were trying to say. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was getting like, that. Uh, you know, it's $80,000 80, that just flies away and I, I, 
I don't know how to. It's tough to swallow, I know. Yeah, it's real tough to and swallow. And like I said, I was trying to hedge that with, with utilization of TIF funds. Um, you know, we have a lot, of, there's no guarantee with developments to their long term success. We've seen that with some TIF projects in the past. Um, but you try and invest into the city the best you can for a return. Uh, I can guarantee you we won't get it if we don't spend the money, but I can't guarantee you that we will get it if we do. What did Wayne Gretzky say? You, you miss, miss every uh, shot you don't take? You miss exactly. <laughs> um, how long How long does this go? Is this Once we get the uh, enterprise, design, if we get the enterprise designation, is, do we keep it for 25 years? It's a 15 and then there's a review for another potential 10. So okay. uh, yes, up to 25 years, 15. Here, here for sure. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Dettine? Aye. Mayor Hill? Aye. Item number 9G is considered appointment to Cubs Commission per Mayor Hill. I'm going to go through and read the names of uh, all the appointments to the uh, Cubs Commission. Um, the, the vice president is uh, David Ferment, um, Will Keyes, Janae Latif, and uh, Lily Walton, Noel Harris, Siobhan Love, Michelle Peterson, Ashley Motter, Adriana Arcia, uh, Josh Dozier, Michael McCauley, Rebecca Burton, Janice Albrecht, Jim Bear. Jeffrey Jones, Richard Frierson, Linda Sandoval, Jerome Cole, Michelle Campbell, Thomas French, Kathy Champagne, Rick Heffer, Patrick Holmes, Chris Fisher. He will, will not, he will not be a, uh, um, appointed, uh, and that's because uh, he's on the city council, and uh, we've decided that. Uh, we don't want city council members on this making a recommendations to the city council. It could just get a little um, sticky. And uh, we also uh, don't want to, we want to be sure that we don't violate any um, Open Meetings Act. Uh, so Regina Parks, uh, Elena Lopez, Morgan Batley, Gina Copen, Madeline Santana, Nancy Payan, Arnie Paulson, Ginny Adams, Chris Shemansky, Sue Whipple, Margie Taylor, Doug Carlson, and Reverend uh, Lavin Pipes. And uh, I'm asking your approval to uh, have these people appointed to the uh, Cubs board. Okay, I'll make that motion. And a motion? Second. And a second. Is there a discussion? Um, Clerk, Mayor, just out of, for clarification, so th those that were Formerly ex officio are no longer and that's not correct. on this commission. That's correct. Okay. Now we had previously myself, uh, Commissioner McDowell, uh, uh, Chief Dumian, and uh, Sherry Neal were ex officio officers on here. But uh, in keeping with uh, not violating the Open Meetings Act, we've decided to, uh, and it's, it's not supposed to be a city council dominated commission, it's supposed to be a citizens dominated commission. So. Those are the uh, appointments. Do we have a, did we vote on this? No. Okay, do we have a, we have a motion and a second? Clerk, please call the roll. Commentary. Additional commentary. Sure. Uh, I, I've spoken with uh, Director Arrington and, and Sherry Neal about working with the uh, building department and them knowing the Cubs members in the different precincts so that we could work with them to understand even more so what's happening within those communities having them kind of as additional spotters even though our building department is pretty much on top of everything but we thought that'd be a great way to, to close the loop and be able to work with the citizens and help resolve some of the issues in the in the different precincts and i didn't uh i didn't mention this at first uh there are, uh, we will have three people from each precinct uh, represented on the Cubs Commission and the um, intent of Cubs is to provide uh, better communications from city, from, from city government 
to the citizens and then also uh, from the citizens to the city government on what's working and what's not working in their uh, individual precincts. So uh, hopefully this will, uh, I think it's going to take a while before it really gets up and running and um, before you'll see an impact on the community, but I think you will see that uh, within a year. So hopefully this will be a good group. Well, in addition to that, with the being on the next door, uh, right. link in, uh, Kathy Champagne and I met, was that about a year and a half ago? And she introduced me to that. And it's a tremendous way for, in addition to Facebook and other mediums to talk about what's going on in the different communities. Right. And the city is on that now. So this is uh, another way for us to continue to, I think, be in touch with, uh, with our citizens. I agree. Um, further discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Dettine? Aye. Mayor Hill? Aye. Um, item number 10 is departmental commentary. Department heads have anything to say? Share with us? Yes. Okay. Um, Attorney Randall and I um, performed the semi annual closed session minutes review, and we have determined that there are no minutes to release this time. Okay. Uh, item number 11 is announcement. February 6th at 7 p.m. is Zion City Council meeting. February 20th at 6.30 is the Zion Township Board meeting. At 7 p.m. is the Zion City Council meeting. Item number 12 is adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. have a motion? Second. And a second. Is there a discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Through that one. Thank you.